Then we'll go to the second page. Mr. Ramus is shaking his head. He's got, he's following me. First, first verse, second verse, second page. Um, we'll see if this works. Okay, I think it'll sound nice. It'll help us think about what we're saying as we sing through, I'll tell the world I'm a Christian. Number 244. on missions over the last couple services and the chapel messages to come the next couple days. I pray that you would work in our hearts to be a witness for you. I pray that you would call people to your service that we could see uh, people work in full-time service and give their life to you. And Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful in our giving so that we can send missionaries out to tell others about Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our efforts, bless this church, and I pray that we would strive to glorify you in all that we do. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll take our hymnal and turn to number 419. 419. Far and near the fields are teeming with the waves of ripened grain. The call for reapers, Lord of harvest, send forth reapers. Number 419. Far and near the fields
It may not be on the mountain's hide or the stormy sea. I'll go where you want me to go. Number 440.
and tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Boy, Brother Reardon, this morning, um, more people in this world and we're sending less folks out. I, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's the numbers God um, is, uh, is, is promoting. Uh, I think uh, just uh, fewer and fewer people. And I'm going to get as much as I can out of this life and the life to come. Um, and uh, you don't realize uh, the best out of this life is living for the world to come. Um, so I tell you that, Lord, Lord, give us a give us a heart for missions. My heart has already been stirred. We're about halfway through, uh, if you count. Uh, so we had Thursday night and then Sunday school. This morning was very good. A lot of you are in different classes. I would recommend uh, go on Fairhaven Media and, 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 and pull that up. Um, and we'll use it for family devotions a lot of times. Uh, my kids aren't in adult Sunday school, but the series on forgiveness and then anger. And then this morning on five neglected slash forgotten words in Acts 1. It's super good. You can kind of just uh, play the pray and, and play a bit of that, talk it through. It's it's, uh, again, just another wonderful resource for you guys to, to make use of. All right, we're growing the church from the inside out. So <laughs> there's, there's a, a, a new little one. So congratulations, Brother Schrock. Congratulations, Mrs. Schrock. She's probably with the baby. Um, but little George. So praise the Lord, uh, uh, another one to, to pray for and and I, I mean that. Let's pray for these little ones. Let's really pray for these little ones. Um, and uh, that God, God can use them. And then each one of us, that we'll do our part to just pour the love of God into their lives. And uh, may it be that they respond at the right time to the love of God. And uh, say, well, I, I want to give, give myself uh, to the one that loves me so much. So praise, praise the Lord for little George. Uh, let's see. Uh, seven pounds, two ounces, 18 and a half inches long. So just, again, pretty tiny. <laughs> That's exciting. Praise the Lord. Uh, okay, teens, uh, you need to have signed up by this Thursday for the laser tag activity on the 21st, I think it is. I, I forgot to write that part down. But sign up by this, by this Thursday for that activity questions can be directed to Ashley Haiti or Caleb Stockman. So again, keeping, keeping that in mind. All right, uh, ushers, we'll have you come down. Brother Skeen, would you ask for his blessing on the offering tonight? Wednesday, uh, late morning, uh, Jolly 60s. Uh, Thursday, we will have our workers meeting and then our service at 7. Uh, Kings Kids and Flyers will be happening that evening. And then Thursday, Friday, we'll be having... Uh, starting Thursday evening and, and into Friday, a basketball volleyball tournament. So be praying that, again, we'll have a lot of people coming in and maybe some of them would say, oh, I, there's a Bible college here. I like the spirit of here, Lord. Maybe uh, I could come and get some training from you uh, here. That would, be, that would be a blessing. All right, so again, so we had uh, Thursday, Sunday school, the morning service, or about three services in. So tonight we have Brother Zadarski. And then tomorrow, Brother Reardon again uh, uh, for chapel at 11. And then I'm going to close things out Tuesday at 11. So we're nearing the halfway point. So um, again, I remember young people, I remember it's like, <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> Lord, no, <laughs> I want to tell you what I'm going to do for you and ask you to bless it the rest of my life. I'm not sure I want you telling me what you want. Who knows what you'll come up with. I've read the missionary stories and all you can trust God. You can trust God. It's not like his way is a little bit better than what you come up with. It's so much better. And I was there. <laughs> oh, what's he going to, you know, what hut is he going to direct me to in Africa with a dirt floor and, you know, all sorts of bugs in bed with me. Um, you can trust God. And, and be, a, again, I'm afraid to live any other life than the one God has for me. You know, uh, may it be that God speaks to our hearts this week. Brother Skeen. Lord God, we thank you for our church. Thank you that we can gather together to sing your praises, to give to you, to study your word tonight. Bless the opening of your word, and I pray that it would be 
preach to us with power, set aside the man that we could hear, thus saith the Lord from the Spirit of God. Lord, I do also want to thank you for the blessing of Lucy and then George uh, to the Spooner and then the Schrock family. I ask that they would be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Father. Lord, I pray that you would call out from among us laborers, whether old or young, that we would be willing to go and that we could make an impact in this world and bring joy to your son for what he did for all of us on the cross. Bless the offering, I pray. I pray. I ask that we would give liberally to you as you have given so much to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and let's stand together as we sing number 416, 416. So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown. So send I you as the Father has sent me. Number 416. So send I you.
be seated. It's good to have uh, Brother Gary Zadarski with us tonight. The video is good to go here in a minute? Okay, good. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to show his uh, video, and then after that, we'll have him come and preach for us. He already has a following here. Uh, anyone that was in the elementary classes got a, a, a nice little diversion from time to time as he would peek his head in. I don't know if the teacher's like, oh, or yes, you know, you take over for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, but if, again, if he came in and, and made you laugh in elementary classes, uh, you, you remember that and appreciate that. Uh, their 29th anniversary was yesterday. So uh, again, what, what, a, what a blessing. Um, I love when God, what's that? Oh. Sam's Club. Sam's Club. Get, oh, man. Uh, frugal. Frugal. That's, that's wonderful right there. Those are good hot dogs. I like those hot dogs. <laughs> yes, yes. Amen. So, Brother Zadarski, he is uh, headed for the mission field of, of Poland. He does have his table out there. It maybe it was crowded when you came in, but maybe try to take a little bit of time afterwards and, and, and take a look at that. Try to guess who the famous uh, Polish people were to the left there. And he's got different things you can look at and, and let, you get, let yourself get excited about that, that uh, mission field. He pas uh, pastored Tabernacle Baptist Church in Quincy, Illinois for over 18 years. His son Daniel, one of our graduates, uh, 2021, is now the pastor there. Gary was born in Joliet and raised in one of the Polish uh, neighborhoods of Chicago. I remember knocking some of those neighborhoods years ago. Dr. McNeely would take a bus load of us out there. Um, he attended Garfield Ridge Baptist Church, where Brother Harold Teasdale 
is now pastoring. He was the one that came over our winter, our Christmas break time, and preached on frustrating the grace of God. So he pastors that church now. Uh, Gary came to Fairhaven uh, Baptist College in 1985 and graduated in 89. His wife, Lisa, is also one of our graduates. Uh, their four oldest children have attended college here, and their youngest, Joel, is a sophomore in college right now. He's the one on the basketball team that's just uh, the highlight uh, fella uh, on our college team. So anyway, it's, uh, it's good to have him. <laughs> no, he does, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I think he does a good job. Um, so uh, it's good to have Brother Zadarski with us tonight. Listen closely as he comes. Oh, after the video. Take me now, Lord Jesus, take me. I would give my heart to thee. Thy devoted servant, make me only thine to be. Savior, while my heart is tender, I would give thee every part, all my talents I surrender, I am thine, Lord, is my heart. What comes to your mind when you think of the country of Poland? Maybe it is the fact that during World War II, over six million Poles lost their lives during the Nazi occupation of Poland. Maybe it is the famous people that were Polish, such as composer Frederick Chopin or Marie Curie, who is the only woman to win two Nobel Prizes and the only person to win two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences. Maybe it is the delicious food, such as kielbasa or Polish sausage, kapusta, sauerkraut, or the always popular pierogies, which are dumplings stuffed with meat, mushrooms, cheese, potato, or fruit. Maybe it is the beautiful scenery that begins at the Baltic Sea in the north, through the countryside of central Poland, and ascends into the beautiful Tatra Mountains in the south. For my wife and me, what comes to our minds when we think of Poland is the fact that there is over 37 million people in a country that is starving for the gospel of Jesus Christ and that are desperately lacking Bible-believing, independent Baptist churches. I'm Gary Zadarski, and God has called my wife and me to go to the country of Poland and serve Him as missionaries. I have served the Lord for the last 18 and a half years as pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Quincy, Illinois, and my wife has faithfully served as church pianist, Sunday school teacher, Christian school teacher and pastor's wife, all while helping raise our five children. Though they are grown, they enjoy serving the Lord as Christian school teachers, a Sunday school teacher, a Bible college student, and as the new pastor of my home in Sending Church. My wife was saved as a young girl growing up in a pastor's home. Attending church was never questioned, and her father, Pastor Larry Hummel, faithfully preached and taught the Bible. And because of this, she realized she was a sinner and needed a savior. At the age of five, after a Sunday school class, she called upon God to save her from her sins and receive Jesus Christ as her personal savior. I was raised in a Polish Catholic home, but at the age of seven, my mother received Jesus Christ as her savior and we started attending Garfield Ridge Baptist Church in Chicago. It was during my time there that I heard the gospel of salvation preached and taught in church services, at camps, and in vacation Bible school. I understood salvation and even went forward during a camp service, but it never became real to me. I never truly repented of my sins and trusted Christ as my Savior. It wasn't until June 25, 1992, at the age of 25, that I walked down an aisle after the preaching of Pastor Terry Angel at Cedar River Baptist Camp. I was the youth pastor, but I finally put my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And now after serving the Lord as youth pastor and pastor for over 32 years, 
God has yet another chapter in the book of His will that He wants us to fulfill. Through much prayer and careful introspection, we believe God is sending us to the country of Poland. Poland was established in the middle of the 10th century and has struggled to maintain its identity. After World War II, Poland was left to the vices of communist Russia. Russia would strive to outlaw God and His Word, while the Catholic Church, which has had a foothold in Poland, from its conception would do no better. You see, having a false truth is no truth at all. The Catholic Church teaches a false gospel, a false grace, and a misplaced faith. It wasn't until the fall of communist Russia in 1989 that Poland was free from the oppressions of communism and socialism, but not all of its teachings. They were free to worship God again, but not from the Roman Catholic Church and its teachings. 90% of Poland considers itself Roman Catholic, which is over 33 million of its over 37 million citizens. Poland is open to other religions and teachings, but sadly the teaching of the Bible as the authoritative and only Word of God is rarely taught. Who will go and try to reach the untold millions who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof? Who will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and faith in His atonement alone for salvation? By the power of the Holy Spirit, the prayer of God's people, and His good grace upon us, we believe God would have us go and reach Poland for Jesus Christ. We believe God would have us learn the language, establish an independent, Bible-believing Baptist church, and then train men and women to serve Jesus Christ with their lives. The Bible says in 2 Kings 19.19, 19, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. We desire to reach the kingdom of Poland so that they may know that the Lord our God is the only true God. We will be sent out of our home church, Tabernacle Baptist in Quincy, Illinois, and assisted by Fundamental Baptist Worldwide Missions. Will you support us in this endeavor by praying, giving, or even joining us personally? Will you help us see God's will accomplished in the country of Poland? Don't know too many words yet, but yakshamash. No, that doesn't mean what's for dinner. That's how you doing. Jen dobre. Good day. So there's a few a few words. So we're getting there. We're getting there. But uh, you go back uh, past the table there. Go ahead, take a prayer card, take a bookmark, and take a sticker if you want. Um, parents, you control that with your kids. I don't know if they stick, what they stick to, if they come off when you stick them to something. And so that is uh, my little, whatever, disclaimer. So you've been warned if they do put them on furniture that's brand new and it can't come off and you're scraping it with a knife or something to get it off. And you say, that Pollock, why did he do that? Okay. Gave you a warning. 
Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2, there's a whole lot that is not in the video as far as God's calling, and there's a lot that goes into that as far as, I, I would just say, be, be willing to do whatever God wants. Be willing to serve, be willing to, if you're not serving now, you might as well forget serving later, doing whatever else maybe you have plans to do. This wasn't exactly in our plans. Our plans were, as April comes along, the beginning of May, we're going to be grandparents for the first time. Well, we are grandparents right now, it's just the baby's not here. But, um, and then to enjoy all that comes with being a grandparent and things like that. But um, God, in His wisdom has other options for not options, has, has other plans for us, His will. And, and so our desire is just to find God's will and do it. It's what we've been taught. It's what we're trying to do. And so you just pray for us that God would be with us on deputation. I hate driving. Um, there are some differences between pastoring and deputation. I, I can't stand driving. And so my wife drove here. To, no, we, we, we switched. We did switch. Um, we switched at Sam's Club after we had our anniversary dinner. And uh, so just to, so you don't think I'm cheap, I did buy a soda too. So <laughs> we did get the whole shebang with that. It was, it was either that or Giordano's Pizza, and we couldn't wait a half hour, 40 minutes for that. So we were in a hurry. So I told we'll, we'll, we'll do something later on. It's only 29. It's not like it's 30 or something. So we'll... We'll, 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 we'll do something. But uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to look at the idea of missions through the life of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, at least at this chapter in Nehemiah's life. You know, Nehemiah, as he was in the palace serving the king, Hananiah and some other brethren came with a report of what was going on in Jerusalem at the time. And Nehemiah went unto them, asked them what was going on, and the report wasn't good. The city was destroyed, the gates were broken down, the people were in reproach, and uh, it was just sad, and, and it affected Nehemiah. It affected Nehemiah in, in a great way. And we see that he prayed before God, wanted God's grace and God's wisdom as he went before the king. The next day he's serving the king, and that's kind of where we come in here. It says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. He had a right to be sore afraid. This could mean his life, definitely could mean his job, but this could have meant the life of Nehemiah acting in any unprofessional way in the presence of the king while he was doing his job could have resulted in his head being chopped off, could have uh, resulted in him being executed. But remember, he prayed. He spoke to God about what was going on. And verse 3, it says in said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I believe that's chapter 1. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, So we see Nehemiah, the king, goes before the king, asks the king, the king asks him, Well, what do you want? He says, I need some time. I need to be able to go there. God granted that, him that. But that's not all. Notice he says, in verse number 7, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me, to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over 
till I come in the Jude. He says, I want a passport. I want letters from the king saying it's okay for me to do what I'm doing, that I can go back to Jerusalem and there won't be any problems. That I won't have any king or any governor or anybody uh, on the way stopping me saying I can't do and then uh, what I'm supposed to do and then go through a, the rigmarole of having to, to go back and get permission from the king. He wanted that permission in hand. The king gave it to him. He goes on and says, In a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and the house that I shall enter into. He says, not only do I want to go, not only do I want letters, I need material. I need a letter. I need access to the king's forest. I need to be able to take your timber so I can rebuild the walls, so I can rebuild the gates, so I can rebuild houses. Well, it's not like he just asked to go. He's asking for a lot. And what does the Bible say at the end of verse 8? And the king granted me according to the good hand of God upon me. God was with Nehemiah in, in, in a remarkable way. It wasn't just taking time out of his life and time out of being this uh, cupbearer. It was taking time out, a lot of time. It was getting permission to go. It was getting permission uh, and access uh, amongst all the other uh, governors that were there. And it was also the material taking from the king's forest. But God granted it to him. See, that's what happens when God blesses those that are just doing the will of God. We're going to look at it in the idea of a missionary, but understand the difference between us going as missionaries to Poland and you here in Chesterton, you here at Fairhaven Baptist, is location. That's it. The same thing I'm going to do in Poland, which is give the gospel to the lost, is the same thing you're doing here in Chesterton. It's the same thing you're doing here on the bus route. There's no difference. There's, we, we shouldn't, in a sense, look at missionaries and say, oh, wow, you know, they're just giving up so much. They're just doing so We're doing the same thing you should be doing. We're doing the same thing many of you are doing. We're getting the gospel to the lost. And as I said, God just has different locations for different people. And if you'll be willing to go wherever God wants you to go, God may call you to another place. God may say, hey, I want you to be a missionary. I want you to pastor. Pastors do the same thing. Though we don't use that name, missionary for a pastor, they're going and going to a, a, a specific city, and they're taking the gospel, establishing a church, teaching and preaching and training. It's no different than what's going on here. It's no different than what we want to do in, Quin in, uh, in Quincy, in Poland. I just want to look at three areas in Nehemiah's life, three areas in the life of a missionary this evening and just drive these points home. The first is going to be authority. Who's the authority of a missionary? Who's the authority in the missionary's life? Is it the missionary? Is it his wife? That's why that hammer's on the table. You go look at that hammer. A missionary gave it from Poland, gave it to us the very first time I went over 10 years ago. It basically says it's there for, to hammer the stupid out of your husband's head. That's what the words mean. Can't make them all out. And she hasn't used it much. So you don't have to worry about it. But well, who is the authority? We'll look at two authorities, a heavenly authority and an earthly authority. We're going to look at the burden. Who was burdened in this case? Nehemiah was burdened. God gave Nehemiah a burden, as we'll see. He went to the men to ask of the condition of the people. They didn't come to him. And then we'll look at the burden itself. The people of Jerusalem, the people whose walls were falling down, the people whose lives were a mess. That's every one of us. We were with uh, Pastor Lewis this morning in Chicago. Chicago's a mess. <laughs> It'll probably be a mess even when the mayor's gone. It'll still be a mess. But you know what? There's people without Jesus Christ, not only in Chicago. There's people without Jesus Christ here in Chesterton, in Michigan City, in Gary, Indiana, in the following areas, in Portage. And there's people without Jesus Christ in Poland. 
Where specifically are we going to go? We don't know yet where our ministry will be. We plan to do language school prayerfully and hopefully in Warsaw. Guess what? There's people that need the gospel whose lives are a mess. We see the outside. We see the shell. We see the person walking into the store, walking in the Jewel Osco, sitting down at a restaurant. That's what we see, and it looks like they're doing fine. But little do we know what's going on in their lives. Little do we know what's going on in, in, in their family. And how many need Jesus Christ. And so we'll look at the burden. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Father, we just ask that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord. There may be some here this evening, God, just wanting to serve you. And Lord, not knowing where, not knowing what you would have. Lord, just help them to maintain that burden. To be a servant. To give their life to you knowing, Lord, that you'll guide and direct them. You will speak to them as the Holy Spirit spoke to the church at Antioch and directed Barnabas and directed Saul and told them where to go. And God, it may be here. It may be here serving in their local church. And Lord, that's just great. That, that, that's wonderful. We look forward to that time when we'll receive a crown that we can lay at your feet. For being faithful. So God I pray use the message in any way that you can Holy Spirit to speak to hearts and drive home uh, a message Lord to someone's heart this evening. In Jesus name. Amen. We want to look at the authority in the life of Nehemiah. We're going to kind of do it in reverse. We're going to look at an earthly authority first then we'll look at the heavenly authority knowing that no, the earthly authority is no good unless there's a heavenly authority. But in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The king was the authority in Nehemiah's life. Nehemiah was part of the captivity. Nehemiah was a servant, a cupbearer for the king. He, he did not have the freedom to just do what he wanted. He was captive. He was a servant. And he needed the king's permission. In Nehemiah 1, 4, it says, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. That's when the men, Hanani and the other men, came and he went to them and said, how, how, how is it going? What are they doing? And they told him, and the Bible says he sat down, he wept, and he mourned. That's how much it affected him. Fasted. Prays to God and says, God, what can I do? God, what do you want me to do? We don't see, we see some of the words here, but, but, but he wanted God's direction. Verse 11 says of chapter 1, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Mercy to, to whom? Before the king. Nehemiah knew he couldn't do a thing unless the king was guiding, was going to give him the opportunity to do what God wanted him to do. And so he simply prays and says, God, give me mercy. He didn't say, God, send me here, send me there. He just said, God, grant me mercy. God, you know what needs to be done. And that's exactly what God did. The king granted him, as it says there, uh, in verse number 4 of chapter 2, Then said the king unto me, What dost thou make request? He's all afraid, thinking, you know, uh, he, his life is in danger. And the king simply says, So what do you want? Nehemiah needed, first of all, an earthly authority to travel to Jerusalem. That earthly authority, he needed permission. He couldn't just leave the work of the king and take care of the burden. He could have had the burden all he wanted. That burden could have been as big as the world, and it wouldn't have mattered. Unless the king said, you can go. A missionary cannot just leave his church and just do his own thing. A man cannot just say, well, I have a burden for Poland. I have a burden for you name that country. I'm going to go. I don't care what the church says. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what the men of the church say. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going. I think according to God's word, you're going to be out of the will of God. I think according to the word of God, you're not following God's earthly authority. God does give us authority in our lives. As he does children, he gives us parents. 
But God also gives us the local church. I did not establish the local church. Fairhaven did not establish the local church. God's word told us about the local church. God established the local church. Jesus Christ established the local church. So many people are, oh, well, the church can't tell me what to do. These people can't tell me what to do. God wrote it and God spoke it. And so a missionary does need an earthly authority, does need the local church to send them. Can't just go rogue. Nehemiah needed the okay of the king. The New Testament missionary needs the okay of the church. In Acts eleven twenty two, you could turn there. We'll be in Acts eleven and Acts thirteen just for a little bit, and then we'll be back in Nehemiah. Just so you know, I'm, I'm pulling this from the Bible. I'm not just pulling it out of thin air. And it's difficult. You say, why? I was the pastor. Do I talk to myself? Well, yeah, but that's beside the point. Uh, do, do I say, hey, pastor, you know, what's going on? Well, not too much. Oh, oh by the way, I do have something to tell you. Oh, what is it? Um, I believe God wants us to go to Poland. Oh, no, you don't say. Well, I do say. So what do you think? You think it's a good idea? Well, I think it's a good idea. Did you talk to my wife yet? Boy, and then we, no, we, we, I didn't do that. But, but, but you understand, as a pastor being called of God to go, it was difficult at that time because what am I going to do? Give myself permission? Am I going to talk to the, so what did I do? Well, knowing that's the case, I had to talk to the men of the church. I had to talk to the men of the church and say, hey, guys, this is what I believe God's calling me to do, and I know I'm the pastor, but guys, you're the church. I'm going to need permission. I'm going to need the church to vote and say, okay, we're going to send you to Poland. Look in verse, um, chapter 11, verse 22. It says, then tidings of these things. These things are the Gentiles being saved up in the Antioch region. And when tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. And so here's the church in Jerusalem. They hear what's going on. They, they want to see, hey, is this really going on? Are, are Gentiles being saved? Um, and so they send Barnabas to go up there. Notice Barnabas didn't go on his own. Hey, I wonder what's going on up there. Why are the blessings over there? I'm going to go over there and see what they're doing. Maybe we can have some kind of, uh, you know, conference and we'll have them tell us what they're doing right so we can learn from them. No, the church sent Barnabas up there to Antioch to see what was going on. Notice a couple verses later in verses 25 and 26. Then departed Barnabas, after Barnabas was there, he departed to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so Paul's brought into this by Barnabas. And they, he comes down and they meet together. And now they're with the church. It says for a whole year. And they're assembled with them. And they're teaching them. And they're instructing them. But that didn't last long. And let me say before I go on to the next point. That's what God would have you to do. You say, well, I'm called of God to do such and such. Well, if you're called of God to do such and such, right now you need to be serving God. Right now you need to be here at Fairhaven serving God. Don't try the easy way out. Don't take the easy way out. Well, I'll just do something, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of be in the background so no one knows when I miss or no one knows really what I'm doing. No, you need to serve God like Paul was and like Barnabas was. And then we see other men here in chapter 13. Verses 1 through 4. Now there were in the church, that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So here are some teachers, here are some godly men serving God in the church, ministering in the church, as it says in verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, okay, that was part of their serving God, was fasting and praying. Let me ask you, do you fast and pray for your bus route? Do you fast and pray for people to be saved? Do you pray and ask God, God, give me a burden. God, direct me in my ministry. You know, 
God doesn't have to, have to direct just missionaries. God directs your life also. And he could direct your life. You could be out visiting the bus route. Maybe God wants you to go on a particular block on a particular day and knock on a particular door. You don't know what it is or where it is, but God knows. And if you're in prayer and you're asking God and staying right with God and you're fasting from time to time as the, um, the Word of God says, God will direct your life and God will lead you to the right people. So these men are working, they're praying, they're fasting. And the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul did not come in a sense and say, hey, we're ready to go. It was God that said, I want Barnabas and I want Saul. What about these other men? I think they were just as godly as Paul and Barnabas. We don't read a whole lot about them, but that doesn't mean they were of uh, any lesser importance to God or to the church that was there. God just had particular people. God just had a particular place for them to go, and God called them. He said to the church, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, yep, they're fasting and praying some more, wanting to know exact will of God, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from then sailed to Cyprus. The church sent Paul and Barnabas. Again, it wasn't Barnabas and Saul's idea. It was God's idea. And God told the church. And I do believe God told Paul and Barnabas the same way the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. That, hey, guys, this is it. This is, this is what I want. I'm going to be calling you. And I believe God did that. But I also believe what God says here, we see the emphasis on the local church. The local church is an earthly authority. New Testament local Baptist churches are the earthly authority assigned by God to send out missionaries. That's the example we see in the Bible. But this earthly authority has no weight unless it has a heavenly authority. God has to be involved. God must be leading. God must be directing. God's hand was upon Nehemiah. Nehemiah just did not... I'll get that word out. Nonchalantly just walk up to the king and say, Hey, king, best buds. You know, I've been serving you pretty good. You owe it to me to go back to... Uh, he didn't do any of that. He prayed. He sought God. He sought wisdom. He sought power. He sought um, the will of God. And God directed everything for him. When it came to the king, it's like, it's, it's like the knife was going through melted butter. It was that easy. But notice he was praying. It was God that worked on the heart of the king to give permission to leave the palace and the king's work to go to Jerusalem. Without God's authority in the matter, there would be no Nehemiah going to Jerusalem. There'd be no Nehemiah going to help in this burden, to, 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 to help the people that were there. It's God that called Barnabas and Saul to be missionaries, commanded the church to send them on their journey. It's God that calls the missionaries while commanding the church to pray and fast and send them. And so we see the authority. It's very simple. God is the heavenly authority. God is the final authority. But God uses the local church. God uses the men and the pastor of that local church. And I'm not leaving out the women. There's a vote. When, when I left uh, a Tabernacle Baptist Church, we, we voted Daniel in. And I said, Daniel, you know, we, we got to vote me in. I want to go out from under Tabernacle Baptist Church. I don't want to find a big church and go out from under them. I, I put in 18 years here. I think I said it would look bad if I go and say, well, I can't go out from this church. I got to find a bigger church, a church that will pay me more money and, and maybe take better care of me. And I said, I want to go to the church that... The, you, you're my church. And I would seek God's blessing and I would seek your authority to send us to go out. And the church took a vote. The vote was unanimous. They, they voted to support us and take us on as missionaries. But not only that, to send us through the authority of Tabernacle Baptist Church to go to Poland to establish an independent Baptist church to witness for the Lord. But as I said, the same thing. You've already been commanded. Local churches have already been commanded by God to do what? 
to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. To come in to go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. God's already called the church to do that. We already have that permission as far as the, the members of that church. And so what should we do? Man, if God's calling you and you believe God's working on your heart, speak to your pastor. Seek prayer. Say, hey, can you pray for me? Can you talk with me? I need some wisdom on this. Pray to God. Definitely pray to God. And allow God to use you. But secondly, the burden. That would be Nehemiah himself. Notice in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. That Han and I, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. So these men came and they were there in the king's palace or at least in the city. And it was Nehemiah that went to them, it says, And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. How's the homeland? You know, you talk about that, we goof around, you know, sometimes when we were younger, oh, we're going to go to Poland, we're going to go to the motherland. You know, we're going back home to, you know, it was all talk. But here's Nehemiah, far away from home. And yet he's still concerned about what's going on. He's still concerned about the people. He's still concerned about the condition of the city. And he asks them, hey, what's going on at home? How are things going? Sort of like college students two weeks after they come to college. You know, they get homesick. What's going on? How, how, how's Junior? How's, how's my brother? You know, has, has he grown a centimeter yet? How's the dog? Is the dog okay? They, they all get homesick. They want to know. It's a little bit different. But notice in verse 3, it says, The remnant that are left of the captivity that are in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Those are strong words. It's not good at all. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. And what Nehemiah heard and the way it was told him, he sat down, he wept, he mourned certain days. This affected him in a great way. I do believe that as a missionary or as a church member that has a burden to reach the lost, wherever your ministry is at, you'll be burdened for those people. You'll be burdened for your bus route. You'll see, you'll see kids that you'll say, man, I, I want to see them grow. I want to see something out of their life, to make something out of their life. I don't want to see them get into the rut of doing just the same old thing, coming for a little while, becoming a teenager, maybe 13, 14, and they start to get to that age where, you know, church isn't important anymore. I want to be with my friends. I want to stay home on Sundays. I don't want to get involved anymore. If you're here and you're just a young teenager, man, get involved in church. Don't, don't let the world pull you away. There's so much I believe that God would want for your life. You may never become a missionary, and you know what? That's just fine. That's just fine with God. God wants to use you where you're at. But you know what? God may use you in that, in, in that situation. God may want you to be a pastor or a pastor's wife or a missionary or a Christian school teacher. But if you're pushing away, and you say, no, I, 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 there, there's more that I want to do. There's more that I want to experience in this life. You know, uh, uh, candy, a piece of candy, you know, that, that only goes so far. Did you notice, man, that I, I, I tell you, bus routes, a piece of candy doesn't do it anymore. Kids want more and more and more. Why? Because they're getting all that already. They get more than a piece of candy. But just allow God to burden you, burden you for these young people. Burden you for your ministry. It may be the opposite. It may be the older people. It may be the jolly 60s. It may be people, you know, like Mr. Leslie. The real old ones. And you may, you know, your heart may, man, I, I really feel sorry for him. He's not the maintenance man anymore. I wonder why. Maybe he's just getting too old. Maybe, maybe his knees are giving out. You know, maybe, you know. I better pray for him. Maybe I should work with him. Maybe I ought to befriend him. He doesn't have too many friends. <laughs> I understand, brother. We don't have many friends. Me and you, that's it. We're friends. Oh, 
treat me that way now, Arnold. <laughs> no, but maybe it is the jolly 60s. Maybe you have a burden to work with the older folk. God gives you that burden. You know that burden? I, I, I believe that burden would be the same burden that God gave Nehemiah for Jerusalem. That burden would be the same God ultimately gave to Paul and Barnabas for Rome, for Corinth, for Gala uh, Galatia, for Ephesus, and for all those other cities. I know sometimes we look at them and say, wow, look at what they did. Look at where they went. But we just need that same burden to serve God in our home church in your church and God will give you one Nehemiah had a burden God gave it to him he said well I don't really have a burden pray pray and read the Bible and say God give me a burden give me a burden for my bus route give me a burden for the ministry I would say just give me a burden to serve and God wherever you choose whatever you choose I'll be willing It's the same burden we have for the people of Poland. God's given me a burden to see the people of Poland come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But I'm going to tell you, God gave me the same burden for the people of Quincy, Illinois. It's not like God has to beat you over the head with, with, the mal with that mallet, that wooden mallet over there. God just taps on your heart, gives you that burden. Man, and if you're faithful and little... You know what, if God's will is for you to be a missionary, God, God will burden you for much. God will give you more. But if God doesn't and just says, hey, this is all I want. I always said, you know, if, if that's all I needed was, you know, I would say Courtney Lewis. He, he was always the one that, that, that was in our youth group that, that was saved off the bus route. And I said, I always said, if that's all God wanted me to do was just to reach him and that's it. Nobody else, nothing else. Praise God, I'm happy. And I would just sit in a church and, and be a faithful church member. And God would be blessed with that. God would be happy if that's what God wanted. We don't need limelight. We don't need big uh, ministries. We just need to follow God and do what He wants. This burden that God gave us for Poland ultimately led to a calling. And that's another thing. It's not in the notes necessarily, but you got a burden for something doesn't necessarily mean you're called to that place either. You can have a burden for your bus route in Gary, but that doesn't mean God's calling you to pastor a church in Gary. He's just giving you a burden for those people. I don't know, I had a burden every time we went on a different missionary um, trip with our church. Yep, God's calling me to that place. The last one, the last big one that I can remember was going to the Navajo Reservation. And at the time we were there with the Haineses, uh, they were starting a new church. They showed us the building. It was a restaurant being converted into a church, and they needed a pastor. They were looking for someone. They hadn't had anyone yet. They were training one man to take over a local uh, Navajo man to take over another church that was started, and so they needed one for that one. I'm like, that's me. I'll go. I could enjoy it. But just because there's a burden doesn't mean it was God's will. Just because I can get excited and go there and help them with vacation Bible school or whatever they had for us to do doesn't mean that's what God was calling us to do. They got a pastor in there, and then it wasn't too much longer after that. His home church pastor said, you're coming back home. I don't think it's God's will that you stay there. Okay, whoa. We won't get into that um, decision. And so I said again, hey, now they're without a pastor. See, I knew I should have went. We're going, we're going there. But again, it wasn't God's calling. You serve God, you have a burden to serve God. Guess what? If God has a calling upon your life, God will call you. God will make it known unto you. You don't have to work it up. You don't have to drum it up. You don't have to say, well, all my friends are doing this. I need to do this. No, we don't need to do anything except follow the will of God. And that burden Nehemiah had for his people, the same burden we have for Poland, is the same burden you should have for the people of Chesterton. 
Do you weep over lost loved ones? I don't know. Uh, you may not have family around here, but if you do have family, are they saved or are they lost? Do they need Jesus Christ? If they need Jesus Christ, guess what? They're in a bad condition. They're just like the people there in Jerusalem. They're in great affliction. They're in reproach. If they were to die without Jesus Christ, they would split hell wide open. Is that a big enough burden? Would that cause you to pray to God for them? And say, God, can you intervene in this, uh, 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 on their behalf? We want to see them reach with the gospel. God, these bus kids don't stand a chance. They need saved parents. God, will you save so-and-so's parents? Would you save his parents, her parents? And truly pray and fast and weep over them. You say you got a burden for them? That's where God wants you. You don't have a burden again. Pray. Ask God. Ask God to see others saved and others helped and God will bless. We know Nehemiah prayed to God for his people. In chapter 1, God loves and cares for his people. That's obvious. Nehemiah notes that. And then in 6 through 8, he confesses his sin. Folks, if we have sin in our lives, that's going to affect our burden. That's going to affect our ministry. If we walk around and there's sin in our lives, and what I'm saying is known sin, sin that we've, we've kept hidden, sin that we keep inside, that we don't let anyone know, but we, we know with God and we try to reason it out. We try to you know, make it sound like it's okay, but it's not okay. If, if we don't confess our sin like Nehemiah did, he confessed his sin, he confessed the sin of the people. We need to be clean. The Bible says in um, I think it's uh, yes, uh, Psalm 66. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But what does he say? But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. In other words, there was no sin left in his life. I want to say left. There was no known sin that he wasn't dealing with. He claimed the promises of God in verse number 9. He called for mercy. You know, sometimes that's all we can do. God, we don't deserve it. I don't deserve a bus route. I don't deserve to be serving you, God. I don't deserve to be working. God, I don't deserve with my life and my past and what I've done, God. I don't deserve anything, but God, according to your mercy, have mercy. These parents of some of the kids, they don't deserve to be saved, but I didn't deserve to be saved either. He said, but you grew up in church at the age of seven. Doesn't matter. Sin is sin. Nehemiah prayed, pray for your people. Pray for your missionaries. Do you know your missionaries? Do you, do, do, you, do you have an idea who they are? Do you know what their prayer needs are? I do have to ask the Kims. Did they, I know they had visas to go for him and her. Did they get the visas for the family yet? Does anyone know if they got the permission from the government to go? I know that's what they were waiting for, and I wasn't sure what had happened. But if they did, and I see some heads going up and down, that's great. That's, that's what we were praying for. And I told people that supported them. I was looking at some of their missionaries over in Missouri, and I saw the Kims. I said, you know, if you'll pray for them here, for this to happen over there, I said, you'll have a hand in foreign missions. You'll have a hand in their ministry. God can answer that prayer, and God can change a, a people, a city, a, a community, because you prayed for them. Paul prayed. In Romans 1, 9 and 10, God is my witness whom I serve in my spirit and the gospel of his Son without ceasing. I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God, to come unto you. Paul was praying for the Romans, for the church at Rome. He was praying for those people. And as he went to Thessalonica, he had a burden for those people. He was praying for them. Nehemiah was consumed with the burden. You have a burden, it'll affect. It'll affect you, it'll affect your countenance. People will notice. And you want to see that one bus parent get saved. You want to see that one bus kid get saved. 
people will start to notice. They ought to. It ought to affect us. And then lastly, the burden. And we're talking about the people. That was the burden of Nehemiah. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Those whom Nehemiah had a burden for were, as the Bible says, in affliction and reproach. It didn't look good for the Jews left in Poland. And you know what? It doesn't look good for those, in, excuse me, for, for the Jews left in Jerusalem. There probably are some Jews left in Poland. It didn't look good for the Jews left in Jerusalem. It does not look good for those left in Poland. You say, why? 90% Roman Catholic. You say, what's wrong with that? They believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe Jesus Christ down on the cross. They believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But they also believe you've got to pray to Mary to be saved. Mary moves the works of Jesus. Mary moves Jesus to do things. They also believe you've got to be baptized in the Catholic Church. I don't know how many uh, funerals I went to of my uh, relatives. But they get that casket in the back. And they're going to wheel them in the front. And the priest is following me. He takes that little, I don't know, look like a pestle and mortar to me. And he dips it in the water and fume, fume, fume. Water's flying everywhere all over the casket. Guess what? They've been baptized into the Catholic Church. Even at their death, they're going to heaven. They even say such. It's going to help them to heaven. And then after the whole ceremony's over, and it's amazing, all the verses that they, pre, or that they read, they can, it basically gives the plan of salvation. I remember we went to my grandma's. Me and my, my wife and I went to my grandma's uh, funeral. And we're sitting there and we're just listening to scripture after scripture. Scripture that we would use to witness to somebody to show them salvation through Jesus Christ. And they're repeating it. But they're as far away from salvation as you can get. And then they invite everyone to come down after the priest has made his little... Uh, Holy cocktail, basically what it is, the different mixture of wine, and they put it in the cup. They used to have everyone sip it and wipe it, and I think now with all, you know, they didn't want anyone to get COVID. I, I don't know when it stopped. But now the priest just drinks it all. <laughs> He's looking out there and says, man, if you could see what I see. <laughs> but everyone gets that little wafer. They all come. They all kneel before him. He does that old sign and puts that little wafer in his mouth and then goes to the next person and the next person. I think now that they grab it. I don't think he actually puts it in their mouth. I guess some are different. But that's part of grace to them. Gets them to heaven ultimately. But deep down inside, they don't know. They don't know if they're going or not. They hope they can make it. But they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that he died on the cross. They believe that he rose from the dead. But they don't believe in salvation through Jesus Christ alone. It's sad, actually. But that's no news to Chesterton. You have Catholic churches here also. You probably work or have friends that are Roman Catholic. Do you have that burden? Things do not look good in Poland. We're bound in the same chains of communism and atheism. They believe in communism. They believe in atheism. They don't believe in Jesus Christ or they don't want to. Things do not look good for the lost here who are dying in their sins and need a Savior. That word affliction simply means evil or distress, misery, injury, calamity, adversity. I can't think of any other evil or distress or misery, calamity, adversity than dying and going to hell. That's what missions are all about. Reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, Nehemiah cannot just forget all that he heard about his brethren and continue to serve the king. Something had to be done. He had to go. God wanted him to go. God made a way. And Nehemiah obeyed. We cannot just sit back and do nothing with the burden and calling which God has given us for the country of Poland and its people. And Fairhaven cannot just sit idly by and do nothing for the people of Chesterton. And you know what? They're not. 
I guess the question would be, are you involved like you should be? Are you praying like you should be? Do you have that burden for the loss that God has placed in your location? Are you also praying for your missionaries? Lifting them up before God, asking for safety, asking for God to, not specifically, but direct the king. That the king would be able to give them the permission that they need to, to, to be with those cities where they're at, that, that in those foreign countries where they have different forms of government, that God would grant them mercy in the sight of that president or in the sight of that king or in the sight of whomever it may be so that they can minister to the Lord the way God wants them to. Nehemiah went, we must go and you must go. Go to your neighbors, go to your friends, go to your co-workers. Go to your ministry. God gave Nehemiah a burden, God can give you a burden. If you already have one, keep praying. Pray that that burden grows stronger. God put in place King Artaxerxes to deputize Nehemiah. Send him to Jerusalem to care for the burden God had given. God put in place the church at Antioch to deputize Paul and Barnabas to go and take the gospel into the Macedonia region to reach their burden, to reach the place God called them. God's put in place Tabernacle Baptist Church to deputize us to go into the country of Poland to share That burden, we're doing that with you, but to take that burden and to go and to reach them. But God has also put Fairhaven Baptist Church in place to deputize you to go. We know God's already said it. God's word already commands us. But God has given the leadership wisdom to have ministries to where we can go and serve God. To where you can go and take that burden God has given you and reach your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and who knows, possibly the uttermost part of the earth, if that's how God would lead. Will you go as Nehemiah went, as we desire to go and just simply fulfill the will of God to reach the lost? Will you go? Let's pray.